Welcome everyone to the Game Dev Discussion Podcast. This week, before we get stuck in, I'm on a new audio setup. I've got my new mic, a new mixer, and a new hardware. Uh, I really appreciate if you guys could feedback and let me know how it sounds, if it's any better, if you, know, if you can tell a difference, if you can't tell a difference. I'm afraid I can't help my voice, is it? I'm born with this. Um, also, remember to you know like, follow, share, subscribe. You know, it really helps me as a content creator. It helps the platform, the Dynasty community. Um, so remember to do that. But this week, I'm very happy. I've got someone I've been waiting to get on for a long time. Jacob Norris. Thank you, man, for coming on. How's it going? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I really appreciate you coming on. I know it's, um, it's early over there for you. Uh, time zones could be a bitch. Maybe, yeah, maybe not for most people. It's 12.50, but <laughs> some of us are waking up later these days. Some people are night owls. Some people. I mean, I'm the sort of person that has to go bed early and get up early. But some people are night owls. Most of my colleagues are counterplaying that night owls. And I think about it actually. Um, what is is that like? Your actually, just out of curiosity, how's uh how's COVID treated you? How's working from home? Is the setup all okay? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't change a lot. Just because, like, with Nvidia, I've already been working from home the whole time. Okay. Uh, and and before that, I was freelancing. So. Mm-hmm. like everyone else was saying oh man it's so cool i'm working from home and and then th- then like the more time goes on people start experiencing the good and the bad that comes with it and i'm like oh finally i have people to talk to about all the things i've been de- <laughs> yeah. either dealing with good or bad all this time so that's kind of yeah. it's kind of interesting not a lot has changed really actually just so i, I can relate to this because yeah i'm the same i've been working from home like before covid and stuff as well how like for those who are probably just go through it right now, I'm guessing you go through the similar stuff that I have, which is it's it's good, but there's like detachment issues from your work. There's the social aspect of being around people, which I really struggle with. I'm very extroverted. I like to speak to people. I like to be around people. So like this whole working from home gig, I mean, that's how it's affected me. I'm having to like consciously yeah. go find my friends and go visit them just to to see them and get used to stuff. What what about you? How has it affected you? Like the, the negative side to working from home? Yeah. I guess, like, the main thing was definitely, since I'd be home all the time, um, I really enjoyed going out to eat or going out to grab a beer. Or just, like, any of the times I got to go out was the really, like, fun or relaxing thing. So that's that's probably the biggest thing that changes. At least at the end of the day, I would, you know, think, oh, what do I want to eat today? What do I want to go do, like, after I'm done with work? Uh, so that's kind of changed because for a while there, then everyone was cooking. And so I did the whole thing where I got really into cooking and trying all these different things. And then two months went by and I'm like, all right, I cooked pretty much everything I wanted to try <laughs> to cook for like the last six years. And <laughs> now, now I'm ready to go eat some food that someone else is making again. Um, they're starting to open up a bit more here all in right. San Diego. Yeah, so we're doing like twenty five percent dining capacity. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like you know Javier Javier Perez. Yeah, yeah. He's uh yeah he's out here in San Diego too. So sometimes we'll meet up randomly, grab a couple yeah bites to eat or something. Ah, oh, so jealous, man. Yeah, I mean being in where I am in England, uh, in the UK, there's literally no game devs near me. I have to like there's a bunch in like an hour away, which I have to drive to in Nottingham. Um, from the Danvers to guys, I'll go visit them now regularly just so like I get to be around my friends again. Um, yeah, no, it, being locked up, it's been. I'm the opposite. I did zero cooking. I had lots of takeaways. I got fatter, and I'm like, okay, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of got to that stage now where I'm like, I put on like a, a hoodie which I used to live in, and I was like, hmm, it's a little bit more snug than it used to be. I might need to, uh, okay, maybe the takeaways <laughs> need to chill a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, the takeaways started coming in for me as well. So <laughs> I feel you on that. <laughs> so I guess uh, I guess we're talking about some game dev stuff rather than how fat we've got. Um, so <laughs> there's one thing that yeah, is one thing we've it's more um, relatable. You know, <laughs> well, actually, maybe less relate. Maybe no, less relate. But I think everyone could probably relate to getting fatter over COVID. I imagine anyway. Yeah, yeah. But that being said. There is, I've been wanting to talk to somebody about this for a long time. Um, there's art, artists like you who a lot of people look up to. I don't know uh, whether you notice or not. Like, I know a lot of the people my age, when we talk about this sort of, don't want to, don't, don't want to put you on a spot or anything, but like this sort of god tier artists in their, in their particular fields, your name crops up all the time for environment art. And I've spoken to a lot of people who are sort of in this category due to the podcast, and I've never really got into this. But 
are you like how sort of aware are you as an artist when you know there's a lot of people do you, are you aware how many people look up to you as an artist is it like no i'm just a normal guy uh, and everyone treats me like a normal guy i think um like i know a little bit i don't know i didn't think i was any kind of god tier or whatever um but it was it was like really weird for me the very first time like way back when i was starting at naughty dog and i went in for my interview and then they were kind of showing me around and introducing me to people at the studio and uh Ro rohilio like the they introduced me to rohilio and i was like oh hey nice to meet you i know your stuff and he's like yeah i've seen your stuff too on polycount and that was the first time like i'd ever talked to someone who actually was like oh yeah i know your stuff and so like <laughs> that was just one small instance and other than that it started happening like a little bit more mm -hmm. and more over time then after like uncharted came out and stuff and and then i was at like gdc next to clinton because we were at the ue4 booth mm -hmm. and someone came up to clinton was like oh hey dude can i take my picture with you and then they saw like my name tag and like oh jacob <laughs> norris and i was like this is so weird <laughs> <laughs> so that's like that's like the strangest thing that i never yeah i never really imagined that or thought something like that would happen so that's as much as i know that like people know my name um i've heard i've heard people know me but it's not something i'm like going around like what's up i'm Dave <laughs> norris how are you <laughs> just this is our business cards and stickers like sign t-shirt yeah, yeah, exactly. Norris, lead artist in video here's my t-shirt here's my card take it <laughs> yeah so it's never been anything like that but um definitely strange like still for me when i see people and they just kind of know who i am I bet it's odd when I, because you know your, you know your own work better than anybody else. And I guess when someone's like, they know you for your work, and they kind of go, "Oh, this this piece is absolutely amazing! Like, I really, this is what inspired me to get into the game art or whatever it might be." Do you sort of go, mm, "Yeah, but I really hated that piece. Like, I remember this. But, oh, I don't like this." But you know, like, I know that's what's like for me. Yeah, you know, someone's like, "Oh, I like that material," and I go. Yeah, that material sucked balls to make. I hated it. I don't even like it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. oh, sh like you don't have to be a Debbie Downer or anything, but it's kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah. I, no, I, I, I never yeah, had like, I never wanted to be like that guy that they come up and, yeah, and then I just start talking shit like, oh man, and then then they're thinking like, wow, this Jacob Norris guy kind of sucks. Now that I meet him, he just <laughs> talks shit about like his artwork and he's all down the whole time. So. <laughs> yeah, like I guess um. I definitely feel that though when they'll when they'll bring up like some people bring up this nature pack thing I made, uh, or especially like my building set now, which is like 2013. I'm just is that like, old? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. I thought it was, I didn't think it was yeah. that old. Jesus Christ, seven seven years. Shit. Yeah. Okay, that's no, actually pretty crazy. It's, it's weird. It's weird. But. With that being said, though, like, is it, does it ever, does it ever influence the way you act online? Now, this is what I have, when I've spoken to people on podcasts in the past, they, they answer this in different mm -hmm. ways, you know, oh, I'm a little bit more conscious of whatever people think we have, like this professional, uh, what do they call it? Um, a professional persona they have online um, because they know I that see. people see it in a certain way. And I've heard the, the opposite as well. I've heard people be like, no, I'll just be me and whatever. If you don't like it, I don't like it. Like, it's just, I'm not a human being. Um, has it ever yeah. influenced you? Like, okay, I need to behave or say certain things or I can't say certain things because I'm an artist and people perceive me in a certain way? Um, I mean, I think for the most part, I'm pretty much the same person because at least even before that, I wasn't super active or like mm -hmm. publicly outspoken on social media. Like, I don't know. I don't even post my my picture really in many places. Like only if people are friends with me on Facebook do they even know what I look like most of the time. Uh, like you check my art station or even Google my name, and I don't think you'll find any pictures of me. Uh, so so in that sense, I've never really I've never been huge on being super strongly opinionated publicly. Mm -hmm. Too, uh, it's not that I don't have opinions, but I also I'm really interested a lot of the times to listen to what people have to say because I'm 
I'm curious what other people think. Like, mm-hmm. I was almost even worried when I'm coming on here that maybe I was going to start interviewing you a bit. Like, so, Alex, maybe you could tell me. About, <laughs> like, I'll just flip it and start asking you all the questions. You know? Hey, it's a two-way co- it's a conversation, man. I mean, that's one thing we do, I I guess. I've had a few um, suggestions, I say, polite suggestions, saying, hey, you talk a little bit too much on the podcast. And I'm like... It's a just it's a conversation. This isn't an interview, man. We're just talking. Like if we, I was talking to my, some game devs at a bar. Like this is the way I treat it. Um, mm-hmm. I I don't know. I always find it as well when I I'm kind of I try to be the same. Like I'm I know I'm a talker. Like I've run two podcasts. I got told off at school all the time for talking. So like in public, I'm kind of like okay. I need to shut my mouth for two seconds and let let let's let, let other people talk and let's just listen to what they say. Um, but it's not intuitive. It's really not intuitive. <laughs> yeah. do, do you find it any different? Like, because as you're doing more of the podcasts and like, you know, you're you're creating your own like awesome artwork. Have you noticed? Well, I don't know if you've been able to notice as much with because like COVID, you haven't been able to go outside or or meet up at uh, conventions and stuff. But have you seen a difference in terms of people knowing who you are now? And like, I'll bring up your name in conversation and say, oh, I'm going to go on alex's podcast I'm like oh yeah alex yeah that's awesome I'm like um has it has it been just kind of expected or do I you think, feel it i think i i this i guess it's two parts i guess because a i'm gratuitously boastful with the artwork like i believe in this like marketing this shit out of anything i post like put it for as many eyes as i can every facebook group on twitter on linkedin on instagram so I guess mm. there's that element where people can't help but see it because I just I'm so I guess forceful with it, which is as good or bad mm. sides to it. People, some people don't like it, some people do. I'm just you know I'm out to grow a brand. This is a business. Out being an artist is a business, especially when you get to freelance art. The one side of which was odd, odd is we had a meet up in January um, because of the podcast. Like I speak to a lot of people. A lot of people know me through the podcast. Like. That's what which is kind of annoying. People know me as the podcast guy. Like, there's a lot of great artists who are known for, like, their piece. There's, like, a piece they're known for. Uh, like, there's Jay Cummings. He's known as the Slaughterhouse guy. There's James Rotosa. He was the pill guy for a long time for his materials. I'm the podcast guy. And I'm like, okay, I, you know, I'll, I'll rock that. Um, the one thing that was odd is when people speak to you and they know you and they know rough details of your life. And you know nothing about them. And it's kind of like you start the conversation on the back foot. They're like, hey, Alex, like, yeah, I like your podcast. I love the art you did. You know, it's cool that you work here. And I'm like, oh, shit, I know nothing about you. I don't even know your name. And you know, mm. like, a lot of the base level information about me. And I find that very, um, it's very, like, odd at first. Um, yeah. But with the conventions thing, like, yeah, that you mentioned conventions and it's just maybe depressed because it's like so much shit got thrown out this year like this was going to be a good year were to you, do a lot of talks were you going to go to GDC yeah yeah I was going to be at GDC I was meant to be doing a um, a talk there and a demo and this was like going to be a good year I was like oh fuck yeah here we go like this is going to be a year I get to do a load of shit and it all went through and I was like oh, okay I guess I guess it's next year um, and I know yeah. quite a few artists like that there's quite a few of my friends who were like this was going to be their first year being able to talk and do these it's gonna be like a breakthrough year for them and it didn't all go through and you're kind of like i hope they manage to maintain their momentum and do it again next year if something goes ahead because yeah this was gonna be a good year for some people um actually on just speaking about like i guess networking or that sort of stuff there isn't you 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 started cg call recently i say you a group of you have started cg call (laughs) oh Uh, yeah a lot of you is a big ass discord (laughs) Yeah, I can't. I can't take credit for that one. That was all get real. Like, uh, I just, <laughs> I, I woke up and then I noticed I was in a new channel and I was an admin and I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> 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 no, but it was kind of something uh, we'd already been talking about for a while, in the sense of, um, you know, social media. I've already kind of said like I'm not huge on that to begin with, but I definitely enjoy interacting with people and i enjoy seeing artwork and i enjoy all that stuff but it was really just a place for us that we wanted to kind of get away from the world Mm -hmm. and just have a spot that we can all hang out as like yeah just just a fun place for artists to 
you know, meet people, uh, share their artwork, look at other people's artwork, talk mm -hmm. about artwork. Uh, there's a food channel. I'm mostly in that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it was it was kind of just an initiative to to find like a nice peaceful place for everyone that we can all be ourselves and hang out without having to see all the stuff that our uncle's posting on on this thing or maybe that the <laughs> friend i talked to one time in high school for some reason i'm still friends with them like <laughs> dude get Facebook away from all that it's so shit I've, I've been going through and just like deleting all the people i went to school with i see someone I'm like who is i don't even know that name and they're not an artist okay you're just gonna go i don't know you i can't be doing that but yeah with, with discord it's weird for me because i i didn't grow around grow grow up Grow up a poly count. I never interacted with poly count. Um, mm -hmm. When I started getting into 3D, Discord was already a thing and our station was already a thing. Um, it's weird because like I hear all these war stories from like you know artists much more experienced than me. Like, oh, poly count Fred, this legendary poly count Fred for this thing, or this poly count Fred about that thing. And I'm like, I didn't experience that. However, Discord is like the new poly count, right? Like you're gonna have artists in ten years talk about. Oh yeah, that Discord channel or that Discord server, and this is where this happened and this happened. Like you're living through both of them, yeah. and you're working through both of them. Have you noticed that? Yeah, like I think it's it's really interesting with Discord because it's it's a similar idea mm -hmm. that you know you're going to be able to share your artwork and discuss things, and you can share work in progress and have like little kind of live forums now like everything's starting to be more live with how interactive all the chats are and facebook mm -hmm. live and instagram live and podcasts either live or recorded uh so so it's it's definitely a similar idea but something we were we were kind of mentioning just barely before we started the the podcast too um or maybe it was just now but yeah like like if you're going to be sharing like it's it's more uh, segmented. Mm -hmm. It's much more segmented now. Like Polycount, you know, you can search for whatever you want in there. It's a big space, and find you know character artists, environment artists, uh, concept artists, film, games, back and forth. It's it's all going to be on there. You just need to look for it. And with the Discord, you kind of have to know people, or you have to know the link, or you have to get your way to get in there in the first place. And as you were saying, like these big threads that people would have um like i did this modular trim thread back in the day on the mm -hmm. this like building set thing i made and then after after you do that they can they can put it into their wiki and people can google it and search for it and all the information's then available for people so i don't know it's it's good and bad that it's moving over to, to discord and kind of away from some of these more online forums that are static and staying there forever so yeah that's a big frustration for me is and that's one that yeah i've noticed is that a so one of the one of my most memorable mo like interactions on discord was in the dynasty one when i was doing my safe house scene i did like a first light pass and i was in chat with uh jeremy jay cummings and dirk Olsoff. And they were just live going, hey, push that light here. Here's a paint, quick paint over. Do that, do that. And we had about two, three hours session on it. And it like it jumped up, you know, exponentially. And I was like, I, that interaction was amazing. I really enjoyed that interaction. But it was only, yeah. it, it, I, I guess there's something romantic about it. Like, But it's only we experienced it. No one else got to mm. experience it. It was something that just for us, it's both a positive and a negative. Because yeah, like you said, with Poly Count, it's like, that stuff's online forever. It's searchable. It's it's documented. Discord is not searchable. Like it, I love the platform, but it is the furthest thing from searchable ever. Like if you want to find a piece of work from a week ago yeah. in an active Discord, good luck. You ain't find it. It's so difficult. Um, but with it being segmented, something I, I I kind of I like, but I can see why it drives people away because it's it's really weird. It's, it's like this new landscape because. If you stumble across the wrong Discord channel for you, say you're an entry artist, and you come across the wrong Discord channel, which isn't the right vibe for you, mm. you get turned off from Discord altogether and you don't use it. Because there are yeah. Discords out there which are, have per particular personalities. Some are very harsh critiques in a good way. Like, they're not being rude, but, like, you know, they're blunt, they're honest. There's so much mm. more student-focused. There are so much far more, like, reserved. 
And hmm. I find that both as an interesting thing because it's something for everybody, but also it's kind of like not dangerous, but I can imagine people getting turned off from game art or like art in general if they come across the wrong one for them. Um, and I, actually, you guys, CG Core, although there is a poly count Discord, and I mean this in the utmost respect, it's not very active. Um, you guys are the closest thing, I feel like, to poly count. And what, I only say that because you cover everything. Like you said, there's digital painters in there. You've got Justin Fields in there. You've got um, mm -hmm. environment art, character art. And it's kind of like, okay, we cover everything, which is both a blessing and a curse because it's a huge Discord. But like, yeah, that's like, if I was to put a pinpoint on that sort of wide berth, it's it's your one. Did you did you guys aim to do that? Was that like the idea day one? Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of fun just because um, like as you're working at different studios, you know, you you meet this person, you meet this person, and then sometimes you'll branch off, and this person will go to that studio, this person will go to that studio. Some people move into film and games, and so as as it was starting up, and we were kind of pulling people in, everyone was already just organically in all these different uh, specialties and in all these different fields, and then those people post on their social media, and uh, everyone joins from theirs and from theirs, and so it kind of just happened that like yeah a lot of the people that were starting it and being mods and stuff that we just brought in our people i guess and our people ended up being everyone kind of <laughs> <laughs> so it's really been fun for me too because when i was on poly count back in the day i was seeing a lot of the same thing and like i didn't get a chance to witness as much concept art or even we have um we have someone in there who did classical like film props, just like handmade film props, working on those things and seeing some of this stuff. And we have like photographers, and um, so the the wide range has actually inspired me even a bit more. That uh, it's 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 really interesting to see things I I didn't specifically ever go out to look for, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and even on my social media, when I'm adding people and and friends are adding me, that I I tend to kind of come into this loop of seeing like only environment art and looking at materials and looking at game art. So I never got that chance to branch out. So on the one hand, it's segmented. The Discord is like off in their own servers. But on the other hand, if you I guess have the right one or if you get lucky enough that you do have such a wide variety of people a lot more people are coming together and i'm seeing a lot more things that i wouldn't normally see i guess uh, so that's been kind of interesting yeah it's it's weird when your eyes get because you we do live in echo chambers like we do interact with our crowd we have our like our clicks of people we speak to and then you see the same art because you, you know, you're all invested in that area and when mm. you get the opportunity to absorb the other fields, I mean, I've got the same with Art Station, like, because I'm having to interact with both 2D and 3D artists for learning. I'm kind of like, I and I, ha I have to watch, like, any learning content that comes in, I have to watch and you know, make sure it's okay. And I'm like... Are you learning these, a lot? Oh, I'm learning a ton. <laughs> I'm, it's great for me. Like, it, we haven't had, like, lots of new 3D stuff. There's been a lot of intro 3D stuff. But the 2D stuff, because I'm a complete moron, like, with the 2D, I'm watching and being like, Oh shit! I never knew that. I didn't know about this, especially the um, the thumbnail stuff. That's great. That's uh, I've it's got me thinking about so compositional things. That I'm like now applying to my own 3D work, and I'm like, oh okay, like putting this big shape here. I okay, I understand why putting this particular shape is ugly. I don't. I before I knew it was ugly, but I didn't know why. I'm getting a lot more of that context to this stuff. I'm. It's it's amazing how. Which makes you realize we do operate in echo chambers, like, and now it's like I, it, you're far more aware of it now. You just sort of go, oh, okay, yeah. I've been, I've seen nothing but environment art for like a month straight. I need, I need to just go absorb something else. I need to go do something else. Um, and I guess that's one thing I haven't actually hung out in that Discord yet. I've been meaning to. I saw a load of people in today, and we we're going to jump in. And then had a meeting with work, and I guess it's good that you have this these different people come together because people I think different artists see the world in different ways as well like they have different priorities mm -hmm. right like you have one person who's like yeah. this is important and the other's like nah this is important that's where I find it interesting like people having difference of opinions in a polite way like don't want to argue yeah them. absolutely it's been, yeah, it's even been fun just kind of jumping in to like the live chats and stuff too because especially uh, 
not only with you know COVID and everyone being indoors, but just the way the industry's going and the way the world's going with the internet and everything that like so many people I'm talking to are from all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you just hop into the chat and uh, you, actually if a lot of the time I'm the only American even <laughs> in the chat, <laughs> but maybe that's only because I'm on at like two in the morning. So everyone else out here in America is asleep. So mm. maybe I'm kind of putting myself in that position, but mm -hmm. It's it's been interesting because then you get different perspectives, not only from the different fields of artwork that everyone's in, but then also the different perspectives of different parts of the world. And um, yeah, the it's 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 been really cool. And and even like there's a, a speed painting a speed painting channel, mm -hmm. and it almost like it almost inspired me to try to speed paint. And then I remembered <laughs> just like like you were saying, I'm not a 2D artist at all. <laughs> But I had a moment where like, wow, that'd be really fun. And then I'm like, oh yeah, but I totally suck at that. <laughs> yeah. So maybe I'll try it for myself. But um, oh, yeah, God. even oh, even like photography, we have like a photography channel. Oh, really? And, you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so uh, there's some super inspiring and super cool stuff on there. Um, some like one of the guys is from from Tokyo, and he's just posting these beautiful shots all the time because you know they got neon lights everywhere and it's always <laughs> raining and it's just like these long alleyways with all the neons and the rain and the umbrellas and just you know droplets of water it just makes you want to make a ton of artwork all the time oh, that's, so that's well, I mean, that's, the good, that's good though to hear like that it still has that effect because i guess i don't know like i, I don't do it but <laughs> it makes no, but me this want is, to this is an interesting thing <clears throat> how how is it being like when you're at where you are in your career, you're a lead at NVIDIA, like you're a lead environmentalist at NVIDIA, like it's about as, you know, prestige as it gets, like in the environment <laughs> world. Is there, a, is there an element of you which struggles to get inspired to do personal work now? Like you've just, you've been doing this for, you know, over 15 years. Is it like, okay, like you, even though you get amped up to do it, you know, I know you see like juniors now and they're like, churn out work constantly because they need to it's like it's necessity mm. in order to keep progressing i need to churn out work now environment art particularly is very time consuming to make a, an environment like on your own even with stuff like mega scans and stuff we're talking like at least a two three month commitment unless you do like a super like uh focus scene when yeah if it's just from a certain camera angle yeah so when you get to your stage in your career and at you know at a level that you are how does that side of you get affected? Like, do you still get amped up to make personal art? Or if it is, like, what kind of personal art is it? Because I can't imagine, like, you know, wanting to make it. I mean, even me, I'm like this now. Like, I do environment art in a day job. But I'm like, okay, I just want to make materials. They're isolated. They're quick. I, you know, I, it's not a huge time investment. How does this affect you? Like, do you get, how does it affect your, yeah. your all this stuff? Sort of? So I think, I think the, desire is still always there like that's something just as artists we're just always wanted to express ourselves and be creative and kind of get that outlet and perhaps like more so in the past i definitely would would come home from from work like uh and just have some kind of inspiration or see something at work that even made me want to make my own personal art and especially since like i've been working from home now uh, I think that almost kind of weighs on the factor too, because then the same desk that I'm sitting at mm -hmm. during the day is going to be the same desk that then I'd have to make my personal artwork from. And so there's kind of like this, this stigma to it that I still feel like I'm at work, even though I would do something with my personal art, even though I have like my own computer, mm -hmm. a separate, like it's all different, like a different background desktop. So I feel like I'm changing rooms, you know, like, okay i'm on my personal machine now but it's it's more difficult for sure to really want to take the time to then like you said it takes so long to get those things done to do it uh, maybe it's it's easier if there's collaborations like mm -hmm. if you're talking with another artist and you guys want to work on something together that that definitely makes it more fun because you can hop on and chat and like share reference with each other and share ideas and so personal artwork in, in the collaboration sense is still possible. But I think, yeah, I guess with a lot of my, a lot of my free time these days, as I 
was getting older, like I was doing more traveling. Uh, like just last year, I was I was only actually at home for four months, and Shit. for eight months I was <laughs> like all over the place. So I was like, you know, Japan and Taiwan and Thailand and San Francisco, um, just basically just doing my thing. Uh, and I'll just plug RTX graphics cards here because I was on my laptop with a 2080 and just able to do all the work I could do from I was like, just about uh, to say what were you doing? Like, so you're working, like you're doing your normal job, but just on a laptop. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Holy shit. Uh, so that was really cool. And I think, you know, especially when you have that opportunity, because like you said, I'm so lucky with where I'm at now and like I did put in so many hours and worked really hard and still do with, with my day job that then there's a party that also just wants to kind of experience what the outside world is like a little bit here and there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the the Discord has brought me back, the, especially now with like COVID times, mm. uh, and you're not able to go out, out as much. That I even I even started doing a couple personal things, and um, but to I won't say anything. New, you're you're remind a new generation of just who is the boss. Like, oh, I see what you're personal. <laughs> like, okay, let me just remind you why why everyone knows my name. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> Are you blushing, Jacob? <laughs> no, not at all, man. I'm good. I'm cool. Jacob, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Um, just just for fun, like I, I won't tell you anything I am working on, just because I don't know if I'm gonna finish any of it, but we'll see. And I guess I, I brought it all around and kind of summed it up. So I don't know if I left anything for you to no. Dude, ask one about thing that you or... did. There is one thing um, you mentioned the time zone thing and like you know this artist all around the world you get to interact with. It is funny because you still have these like kind of ecosystems of artists, like in Europe, for example. Like everyone knows kind of everyone like within Europe. You know, like um, you know, you've got stuff like the Experience Points Discord and the Dynasty Discord. Both very heavily EU focused, uh, both from based in, in Europe, one in England, one in Sweden. And like the community knows each other. Like artists within all like from junior to like senior, everyone knows each other's names. They know of people, maybe not personally, but they know of people. Um, they see them hang out from time to time. And I started a counterplay and Kurt Coops is there. And I was hanging out with them guys like it so I work, uh, when I'm working on counterplay, I work to US times. So I'm hanging out with them in Discord. And there's so many artists you're not aware, I'm not aware of in the US. You just don't interact with them. You never get to interact with them. Mm. And they were doing the same thing. They were like, they knew it from like um, coalition days and EA days. Like they do Clinton and then edited this, this Evan, but they knew each other, but not directly through somebody else who they all knew. And it was like, they had the same thing, but it was completely sort of, independent from europe um <laughs> that i still find odd that there is that there's like na game dev and there's eu game dev and then that's not even to speak to you know um asia and africa because there's still tons of like freelance artists in like south africa like but there is a divide like no no not divide nothing like that but you know the communities don't interact as much there's not as much overlap yeah. And I find that yeah. quite curious. It's like, oh, this day and age where it's like it's all international. Like, I mean, we know the main artists. We know you. We know Clinton. We know Kurt. But like the mids and the junior artists, people in the EU don't know so much. It's not so common to know each other. And I find that quite curious. Like, I'm kind of like, huh, modern day, internet's available. Speak to anyone around the world at any time. Yet we still have this, like, I, I guess it's time zones as well. That's probably an obvious, an obvious effect of it. But yeah, just. When you mentioned the fact that you get to speak to all these artists all around, I was like, yeah, but it's still weird we have this, like, disconnect. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and even even then, there's so many artists that, like, just don't post anything a lot of the times. Like, I don't know how many people I could tell you that I worked with that are just incredible artists, but you would never know their name. You've never heard of them just because 
they're just doing their work. They know that they're going to stay like at the company that they're at. So they think no reason to post up portfolio or share. They're just like doing their job and they're fucking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but we've never heard of them. And so, yeah, it's interesting. Like you're saying, as the juniors are coming up and people just aren't knowing each other as well, I guess, in that sense. I mean, how else do you really know people though unless they are like posting or you have worked with them so would that be kind of a question to ask about like marketing yourself is it less less of a a question of just like or is it more of a question than than now as games are getting easier to make and as material is becoming materials are becoming like easier to get a hold of to learn things that there's so many more artists too mm -hmm. uh like I guess that's that's the other thing is I try I try like every time someone's gonna follow me on our station like I can't I can't get to everyone but I almost click on every single person that's following me just because I want to see everyone's portfolio and check them out and see their work and stuff and there's there's just so many awesome people these days doing incredible things and yeah. um, it's tough to keep up it's tough to keep up with everyone like. <laughs> That marketing thing is weird, man, because, like, it still catches me off guard now. Like, I always, whenever I'm speaking to my friends, and like, oh, I think this person is, like, the strongest artist in this category. And I'm like, yeah, it's hard to say, though, because how many ninjas are sat quietly chugging along in their studio? And I mean, even a counterplay I started recently, there's, like, four artists I never heard of. Mm -hmm. Just never seen them on, they don't do online. Yet, I see their work, and I'm like, holy shit, these guys are monsters. These are, <laughs> like top tier talent and i've never heard of one i'm like oh yeah people people just not everyone cares about the whole so the online presence thing they just chug along with their job and just be mm -hmm. beasts in the daytime and that it still catches me off guard now like as soon as i started i was like you know there's certain artists there who are new you know i looked up for t to tim for a long time enrico anna evan kurt i knew these guys uh because of you know they're they're pretty how prolific they are on online and then there's artists mm. in there who I just, I see their work and I go, holy shit, how have I never come across you? Like, it's almost an injustice, but speaking about, actually, the thing you just mentioned about, you know, wanting to see everyone's profiles. There's something Chris Rasby said, he he likes browsing our station to see if he could find the hidden gems. Um, yeah. There's, he will just come across an artist who no one knows, and they haven't got many followers, but they are amazing. I've only found one, like, I, I say found, I've, I've done this once where i've been like oh you have not got many followers but you're amazing as an artist i'm like oh shit that's actually a pretty cool feeling and i guess that's a similar thing right like you go through the people who are following you and you're like oh you're actually really good you're really good oh you're not got a huge online pr presence that's kind of odd oh cool like that i guess you get that sort of resp um, response to it right yeah yeah i mean it's also just like fun and interesting to see like who's out there and then um I also want to like interact with the people that are trying to interact with me. And so going and looking at their work and start like, you know, liking stuff or commenting on things and uh, checking it out, just still trying to stay a part of the community since, you know, maybe I'm not on poly count as much and uh, that sort of deal. But there was something that I was thinking about too when you were talking about like posting in all the different groups and all the different chats whenever new artwork is coming out like yeah at least for, for me was it ever difficult for you because i don't know like i have a difficult time wanting to promote myself or wanting to like say good things like check out my new awesome thing like i don't know if i if i'm really the type of guy that wants to say that like how how do you get past that or how do you how do you word things that you can feel comfortable sharing it without feeling like you're just bragging or uh, um, just wanting to share and promote but not I guess not doing it in a way that makes you look like an ass <laughs> <laughs> well whenever I promote work I very so I never really talk about the work when I post it it's it's very objective it's very here's a piece of work mm. this is why I did it that's it like you can click the link or not I don't really I don't there's no call to action there mm. but I guess as well, I get, I, my, my early career was very much, I was around like the business side of stuff, being in smaller studios, I got into a position where I was focusing on the business side of things quite a lot. So 
I'm kind of I've always had that mindset of like long term growth as a career. Like especially when you look at stuff like contractor and freelancing, your online brand is very important to like getting more work. I'm very aware of that. So it's like, okay, I've got to learn and develop, but I've also got to maintain a certain brand thing. And I've just always been thinking, like, I want to get to a point. So I'm not there yet, but I want to get to a point in my career where, like, I can be a full time contractor on like lots of projects, and I never, I'm concerned that I'm never going to have work. I know that uh, if I go look for work, I'm going to be able to find it within a few months. Um, so that's why I've always sort of been like, and I watched, did I, I spent a lot of time watching people like Gary V online, who's super like um, audacious in the way he, you know, talks and the way he markets himself. I'm like. I've maybe some of that's linked into it where I'm just like, I'll just pull it out there. It's nothing but positive art. Like, and that's probably why I don't have my online presence is very, I have very little time to like post much about what I think because I worry about spamming. I do. I am actually quite conscious about spamming, but I'm like, I post the new artwork, art station stuff, podcast stuff, empire stuff. That's at least like one post a day. And I'm like, I don't really want to, my people my time people's timeline to be filled with just shit i say so i'm like okay i won't <laughs> i won't post much about what i think because you know i mean who actually cares like oh man i mean i think we all think feel like that though man i just i well, at, at the same time it's nice though that you don't have to worry as much about posting individually what you're thinking throughout the day because if you're if you have this platform like a podcast you get the chance that then um you can just share the podcast and people can come like see multiple multiple thoughts and like they can come join if they if they're interested and it's not like you said you're flooding their timeline with Mm. random stuff or random thoughts or opinions or uh, just like throughout the day I mean, Discord's good for that too. Like, I spend mm. all my free time, even when I'm working, I'll sit in Discord and talk to people. I need, like, I like being, I'll sometimes just sit in Discord with like 12 people in and I'll be quiet. So it feels like I'm at an office, like, everyone's talking and talking shit or whatever or joking about. And it's like, it's good for me. It's like, it's, it helps me feel like I'm around people. Um, mm. And I think that's probably part of it too, is that I talk that much on pod, like I said, on podcasts and in Discord that by that point, Anything I've got to say, I've said to anyone who I actually care <laughs> care about. Um, and like on world issues or anything like that, I'm kind of like, I'm very selfish in this mindset because I'm like, I have so much stuff going on in my life. I mean, my friends that I need to focus my energy on, that I'm not going to then waste my mm. en- energy talking shit about something else which has nothing to do with me. Like, that's yeah. also part of it. Um, but yeah, but the posting thing though, it, it's. It's very divisive, I find, because I do know it's. I've had people message me in the past and say, "Hey, like it, it feels like you're spamming." Like, because there was a point when I was doing like, um, a material every other week or a material every week. There was like, there's a block of time that I just uh, had free weekends, and I was just churning out work. And people were like, "Oh, it's quite spammy," and I was like, "Okay, hmm, what do I think about that?" I was like, "Well, it's just art at the end of the day." Like, spammy or not, it could be worse. I could be spouting racist bullshit online. Like, I'm just putting posted artwork, man. Like, and it, I don't know, yeah. it, it kind of it bugs me a little bit that there's this negative connotation to posting like, post artwork. It's like, oh, you're spamming. It's like, well, it's just art. Like, I'd rather people spam artwork than political opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess there's always those features now on social media if someone really thinks you're spamming then they can just say like i want to take a break from this yeah. individual <laughs> for now uh so i guess i don't think it's as bad if people want to spam and like the or they are just doing artwork all the time or even they just want to share their opinion all the time like that's totally on them and I don't think I have anything against it, but I would say like maybe the more you post and the more common people just see it like constantly, it almost becomes like numbing that then Diminishing maybe terms. they'll they'll see it and then like, oh yeah, another one, and just kind of keep scrolling mm-hmm. in comparison to to yeah sharing either like deeper opinions less often or sharing like stronger mm-hmm. artwork uh less often or maybe doing like a drop like it might be interesting if 
if someone is initially doing like materials a week and then all of a sudden like they're gone for a bit and then all of a sudden 10 materials come out it's like oh yeah, shit yeah. i was wondering why i didn't hear from you for a while <laughs> like check that out uh maybe maybe that's a way to like mix it up it's very especially those substance share things like i see people mm. when, when whenever someone comes out with a drop or like there's an uh art station drop of like artwork for a game or whatever else and you just like the whole thing is flooded with it that's that's always kind of kind of fun to see too i find that very curious because that's what i do know so being the time you know i do spend all my time watching discord i like people watching as well like you watch um members of the community go quiet and they go quiet for a bit and you're like huh wonder what's going on there or it goes the other way you see them start talking more you see them like interacting more and doing more stuff online and you're like huh wonder what's going on there and mm. every time i mentioned it to my like sort of circle of friends like hey you know it's like so so is way more active now isn't that interesting wonder if he's looking for a job a month later he's like applied <laughs> or like accepted a new role and like you just watch people do stuff online and you sort of go you can sort of see patterns of what people are doing and i find that really interesting because nearly every time it's true um mm. but with the like the um, frequency of drops the cadence of it I also think it's who you're... I mean, that's an important question, I suppose, as well. It's like, who you're doing it for? Because um, mm. I know when I was when I was doing the... Um, when I was, I suppose, quote spamming, it was like, okay, I want to start doing, like, materials where I use outside resource. Cool. Let's use ZBrush. This is my result of my test with ZBrush. Now let's try Marvelous Designer. Now let's try Blender. Now let's try the simulation. Now let's try Houdini. And you're doing these things. It's like, okay, yeah, like, Everyone who thinks it's spamming is like, yeah, cool. But also, it's a self serving thing, I guess. Like, it's, again, it's a selfish reason of doing it. But that R dropping, this, have you, um, I, this, this is a completely random question. Have you heard of NF? <laughs> NF. Uh, uh, he's a it... hip hop artist. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't, yeah. It's fine. So, there's people like him, and actually, Eminem has been doing it recently as well. Like, they don't promote their albums. There's just one day, like they drop an album. Uh, Eminem yeah. did it with Kamikaze, and it just yeah. comes out of nowhere and just blows up the internet. And it's like, if when you say like the art drop thing, I'm like, yeah, actually, that'd be curious. You imagine someone like, um, God, who's killing at the moment? I guess you could say D- Daniel Tiger. He's been very slowed down a little bit recently, but Daniel Tiger. Imagine if he just went silent for like a year, and then he just drops like <laughs> this <laughs> yeah. massive thing. You just go. Oh shit, that's why he'd be going quiet. Because that's what signature yeah. series is. When Jonathan Bananas went quiet for a while and then dropped two signature series, I'm like, ah, that's why you're quiet. I see now. Fair enough. Yeah. It's very yeah, curious. Because they're still doing their artwork, but it's then something that they just are going to share all at once. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, like, this is this is not entirely related to the artwork aspect but like the ai aspect it's funny that you're mentioning like if you can start to kind of see patterns and like like you said like someone's dropping off or maybe they're posting more in this group or this channel uh like i think the really crazy thing is there's probably enough ai or algorithms and social media that it can actually see who you're interacting with and like the way you're posting and the way you're dealing with things that it'll start sharing advertisements with you like are you looking for a job (laughs) stuff like that uh no that's not even that that's you know that's um, every first year that's not even that crazy at this point it's all said to me they know when you're looking for job ads and they can tell by like your behavior online Mm. i would not be surprised (laughs) It probably happens already. What were we fucking talking about? This happens. It must do. <laughs> like, the weird thing is a lot of people don't even know that uh, social media is actually tracking your scroll speed mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. So, yes. So, even if, even if like, you're not liking something or whatever, but if you're hovering on a post for a long time and, like, oh, that's kind of cool, zooming in, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah, yeah. go past it. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, it's it, it knows exactly, like, what to show you and what you're interested in and I'm sure. I'm sure they could. They could like find almost anything out about you uh, with all the information that they have. Like well, whatever they, keep, they want uh, to know. They keep like cat logs on you. Like uh, social media would keep track. So say for example, I um, I say, oh, what was the example someone gave me? It was for the Cambridge Analytica stuff. But it was like, I say I'm going to the restaurant with my mother. I don't tag her. I just say I'm going to the restaurant with my mother. They have now like a side category for me, which says mother. And they will basically like 
it creates a profile for you in your life based on what you post, and then it'll slowly mm. fill in the gaps but when it when it can. And they like the way they described it was you can ask someone who's like, okay, my mother, you never ta- you never tag her, you never ever tag her. But someone else posts Alex's mom, Sharon. Okay, it will now attach that name to my profile. Okay, we know his mom's called Sharon, mm-hmm. and it's like it will build these networks out. So you imagine that aggregated across Twitter, our station, Facebook. Discord. It's like, oh, there's a lot of information yeah. here we could probably use. And then that's why we take into account, I guess, like, they could probably get hold of Slack in, like, internal company com- communications. And you go, oh, okay, that's um, scary, terrifying. Maybe it's positive. Maybe it's good that they know when I'm looking for a job and they just show me job ads. And I'm just like, great, I don't have to look now. <laughs> that's how I've always thought about it. Whenever people get yeah. to our data, I'm like, yeah, have my data. If you show me what I want to see, fine, whatever. Like, <laughs> doesn't bother me yeah i know i definitely i definitely like hand over a lot of info just for the convenience of things <laughs> like I, I totally keep all of my google maps history because i want to go back like three years and then look on this day I, where the heck was that place i went to that restaurant i really want to go back there <laughs> or like that yeah my friend took me to some some pub and i couldn't remember the name and oh there it is like i love that convenience of it and uh, yeah i give up way too much just for that and uh, yeah uh, it's okay like i'm still doing good hopefully i'll live into my 80s and whatever they got all my info that's fine i, I still know where i ate on thursday you know july 20th <laughs> what do you mean? dude 80s you'll be like pessimistic but at that point we're gonna be living to like 120 or something man like average age yeah. just keeps going up i mean i think average age is above 80 now right i'm, I'm sure we've hit 90s average age yeah is- i guess like it's more so just that i i just kind of like 80s as like a good number of I think I'd, I'd still be sane and <laughs> still be able to move and be happy. <laughs> like, I kind of set a time for myself. Like, yeah, 80s is a, is a good round spot. I'll stick around that. <laughs> yeah, speaking to kids, like, you guys don't remember the poly count days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I'm doing that already. You know? <laughs> True, <Exactly>. actually, yeah. <laughs> well, actually... Yeah. Yeah. Is people were even asking me just the other day like what's the first 3d program you were using and i was like oh back in my day i was using this what was program. it you ever heard of like milk shape 3d milk shape 3d milk shape no, 3d yeah yeah and i still don't even know what it is and i use it <laughs> but yeah it was like so i actually got into making games because i broke my xbox trying to make it play playstation 2 games like i said i'm not a tech guy (laughs) tech guy uh and then i broke it got it modded after i got it fixed because the same guy who fixed it modded it for me and then i found like a halo modding community uh and then they were like, oh, yeah, if you want to, like, do some artwork, download this Milkshape 3D, and you can change the artwork in Halo. I was like, what? And so I'm, like, Master Chief big head mode and just scaled him <laughs> up. And <laughs> Yeah, so that's actually how I got into games, and that was the, the first program I ever used for, for 3D. Dude. I don't do. Do you remember like how you got into it, how you got into it or what the first program was or? My first program was 3ds Max. Uh, mine was I, I didn't get into games until like, uh, 2011, 2012. Like it was, um, no, sorry, it was before. It was 2010, I started my education on it. Went to college, had a terrible time. My lecturer literally didn't teach us anything. The only way we taught each other was there's like only two or three people in the class who actually wanted to be there. The rest it was just a dos and it was uh yeah would like i'd make fire and 3ds max as a vfx and then the other person would be like hey look i made a tiling texture well look what i could do i made water we just one up to each other constantly um yeah. after that it was a self tour but i i knew i wanted to work in games i wanted to be a character concept artist originally um i huh. i the problem was at a young age like between the ages of like 16 well 15 and 18 i was like pursuing a professional sporting career so any of my free time was not spent on character art it was like i just didn't really pay much attention to it and by the time i sort of like quitting rugby i was already into 3d and environment art so like when i actually started dedicating myself to it i was already dedicated to environment art at that point um yeah first 3d package with 3ds max 
I'm now a blender guy. Um, and what was it? There was yeah, UDK, Mudbox, Photoshop texture. Has, has Blender become like the like the the vegan of of game art, yes. where like anyone who's using it is like, oh yeah, you should go vegan. There's there's, there's like, a magic combo. There's a magic combo. There's Blender, which is vegan, and we've got Houdini, which is CrossFit. And them two come perfectly <laughs> together. Like they're, they're the two. Um, no, it's kind of it's it's actually kind of annoying. Like, cause Blender has. I, I mean, I like Blender. You know, I was stingy. I'm a freelance artist originally, and it was like, okay, I don't want to pay for Max. Let's see. Blender seems to be quite good. Someone taught me Blender. Uh, Michael Kinsey taught it me, and stuck around. Is all right. Did a job for me. I barely do any modeling these days anyway. But the Blender mm. community online, man, Jesus, like. It's kind of like the gaming community. I say the gaming community are both the best and the worst community in the world. Blender's that of the 3D world. Like, every time someone posts about Max being a little bit annoying, you should use Blender, you should use Blender, you're being an idiot, why are you using Max? It's like, oh, <laughs> God, leave the guy alone. <laughs> it's, it's constant. Yeah. It's very annoying. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, though, I have seen some amazing things with Blender and even in the back of my mind the whole time like something will crash with maya and it's like you should use blender and i was like <laughs> oh, dang it. yeah it's it's a great software and and you know if um like that's one cool thing about this open source sort of platform and this style is like if a company isn't isn't uh, catering to the people that are actually using it like max and maya and if they're not advancing the software and actually changing things for this crazy amount you're paying for then there's options now and yeah. it's not just like an option like for some people it's like their main thing like oh yeah i'd never switch from blender because not only is the support amazing but then there's tons of like tools and add-ons and stuff that you can just turn it into almost like any, any software you want because of like how versatile it is i guess it's I, okay i don't credit this completely to blender but i feel like i noticed it well then i don't know whether it's because i was using blender but I like the fact that it feels like it's pushing the industry. And what mm. I mean by that is, we don't see ZBrush updates very often. How often do you see ZBrush update? Blender comes out with this cloth brush, which is super amazing. A guy's posting on social media and it's absolutely incredible. And then suddenly ZBrush comes out like about two months later and they're like, okay, we've done some work. We've made this new feature. And it's like, oh, okay. Like, yeah. that's nice. 3DS Max with the smart extrude. I don't know if they, they could have been working on it in the background, but I can't help but feel like some of the moves the blender's been making someone on auto desk was like okay we need to like do something and the new smart mm. food from max looks amazing it looks really really good um i love that sort of thing i love seeing comp i always feel like uh, no one should have a monopoly and i feel like autodesk had that for quite a long time with the 3d packages yeah. i like seeing competition i mean it's i don't want one to take over you want a multitude so we keep pushing each other look at um substance and quixel them two have been pushing each other for the past ten years to constantly keep improving, mm. and they can't they can't sleep for one second. Otherwise, you've won <laughs> it's great. It's good. Yeah, it's a really good. It's a really uh, good I love. Moment. I love. Like you can see, you know, both mixer and bridge, and then substance painter and designer. That like as both ones are adding new features and new ideas to it, you'll see similar things pop up in the other. And yeah, like you said, it's awesome. Like I love the fact that I can switch between them pretty easily. Um, and there's just so much content for both of them too. It's wonderful. Uh, yeah. And I guess, yeah, I was. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit before we started the podcast, but like uh, relating to all these softwares and all this kinds of stuff, and the AI we were just talking yes. about. Uh, like, so are you are you pro or anti AI for creating artwork? And like, how do you think that's going to be affecting the way artwork is made? moving forward for artists i think how i think we can use ai i can, so there's, a, there's something shadis fadi said actually on so this is not a shameless plug but on the most recent our station podcast he was talking about how he, he uses 3d in concept art um and he said okay no longer do i need to spend two days doing a base paint to then start actually trying to make it look good i get to the end of a base paint in a few hours and then I could start actually trying to make it look good and do the final touches and add my artistic flair. I kind of feel the same way with AI or procedural tech in general. It's like, it will get us 
80% of the way there, all the boring legwork will be done up front. And then mm. I have 20, that time is now invested into that final 20% to push it over the line to be something special. Um, I mean, like, you, dude, like, you've seen this a million times. You've been in career long enough. Like you, software comes and everyone's like, it's taking our jobs. It never does. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're still Actually, there's so many more jobs now. Exactly. Um, like, like, do you think that artwork is more the actual aspect of the creation, like the time put into it and the technique that you're using to make it, or is it just about the final piece? Like, once you share it and here it is, like, what what is artwork to you? I think this is where me and I, I'm going to upset some of my friends about this because we argue about this all the time. So if a tool comes out, a, a designer node, say for example, someone makes a really good designer node. I don't care how it's made. It's a good tool. I'll use it. It makes great art. Good. I'm happy. Don't need to know. Um, I'm kind of like that with the artwork. If the final output, out, you know, output looks good, whatever, fine. Whatever gets me there quickest and that obviously doesn't influence future work. Whereas a lot of my friends, I know like um, Ben Wilson, Michael Kinsey, they want to know how things work so they can then iterate on it and make it better. I don't really think like that. I'm kind of like, if it works, it works. I just make my end product look as good as possible. So I think to your mm. question, yeah, I, I mean, it's always, but I mean, it's always what the end product is, isn't it? Like, if you can make it in a clever yeah. way, like when you take production into the mix, like, okay, I can make this in 20% of the time that you can in your way. Okay, then yeah, I start to care about how you made it. But if all we're looking at is objectively mm. the final piece, yeah, I don't really care how something's made, whether it's zebra sculpted, whether it, for material anyway, like it's a good case study. I couldn't care less how you made your map ball. If it's a cool looking map ball and it's a good material, you, yeah, I'm happy. What about you though? Like yeah. you, you've, you've been around a lot longer than me. Like what's your take on all of this? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm on the, the same, same boat that basically, uh, even when people are, are working, uh, like working with them, I tell them, I don't really care like how you make it like mm-hmm. this is how it should look in the end like as long as the end product looks good I don't I don't really care how you got there uh and even even I I gave a talk at at my school way back in the day um about I feel like I'm dating myself and I'm like way back in the day yeah, I'm like <laughs> you know in my 50s or 60s now, but, <laughs> sorry but, uh, webcam dude you're fine I can see how young you look you're good you're good <laughs> Yeah, I got my filter on, like, I'm, I'm looking good, right? You can't see all the wrinkles. No. <laughs> um, no, I'm actually, uh, like, like I talked about modularity and showed that I even took this this um, work light. So I had, the work lights have those metal cages in them yeah. that kind of, like, you know, whatever. Uh, and I, I took that in my scene and I scaled it up and jammed it into a wall and then I was like I now I have a ladder <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> not that you would actually do that in a game but maybe in the sense that you know what, I'm going to take that geo rip it off of there delete the work light stuff just throw on a tiling texture put some decals make mm-hmm. it look dripping or something that's like some rust coming off the sides and like how fast I made that now yeah, I've yeah. got my ladder. Someone else is going in there, hand modeling it, painting it in Substance Painter, and doing all this stuff. And I'm like, it looks the same, man. And I did mine in like 20 minutes. Yeah. So, so in that idea, if AI can take away a lot of the grunt work, if I can take away uh, some things, maybe like you know UVing or uh, just like snapping all these individual verts together to get like a clean bevel or a clean line around this thing, if I can just use it to get my vision out there and my idea out there quicker then i think i might do personal artwork even more often to be honest because then i could express myself faster yeah the, the, actually i draw a line on the other side of things to be honest there's a lot of times when i've seen art and i speak to my you know peers and i'm like that was kind of weird and it's like oh yeah it's a limitation of the tool because it's doing some clever procedural way like whether houdini rocks is one which you see quite a lot i'm like oh them cracks look a bit weird yeah it's the only way who do you can do the cracks i'm like okay well that you know okay fair there's a limitation there with the tool but we still need to make good art at the yeah. end of the day that's when i yeah. get hung up it's the same with design i see this quite a lot like oh i couldn't do this because it's you know designer doesn't let you do it I'm like well you, okay you need to, 
the great artists, the, the big material artists, figure out workarounds to make it work or find alternatives. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's where, with this whole procedural side of things, I draw the line is that the pre- being too clever for your own good way, you actually limit the quality of the art is where I'm starting to say, okay, no, like you may have saved 10 hours, but if you've got like something that doesn't look as good as what I can get, like with an extra couple of hours mm-hmm. work, that's when you probably start to see some dis- discrepancy or disagreements. Um, cause I still see this with like the ZBrush materials. I mean, I did one where I spent like a couple of hours on it and I'm like, oh, this really worked. Like, okay, this is quote old school. And that probably sounds awful to say to you cause you remember the Photoshop days, but it's like, <laughs> it's, there's something about a handcrafted sculpted material. Where I'm like, I can't get this in designer, not quickly. Like mm-hmm. there's something about it, it the hand authored look to it. And yeah. I don't know. I mean, with the future, just speaking about future stuff, I can see us going back that way where it's just kind of like, okay, all the really time consuming, boring shit you want to do, baking, low polys, all of this sort of stuff. Oh, you don't need to do that anymore. Okay, you know what? All them cool procedural tools we've been developing. Let's go back to old school a little bit. Let's use ZBrush because we have time to do it now. All the boring shit you had to do before isn't an issue anymore. Like, I think we might go that way. Yeah. I think the traditional stuff might come back a little <laughs> bit. Yeah, like, uh, like even when I say AI in that sense, um, not necessarily the making things procedurally, mm-hmm. but yeah, like allowing you if you do want to have more of that control over it. Like ZBrush gives you so much more control to literally put every detail exactly where you want it. That if if you had that opportunity with software that gets you like the things you want quicker while still allowing you that individualism and that very precise sort of artwork to create like i think i think that's what i mean that um i can see ai Mm. going in that direction too so if if something is looking procedural then it's not done properly yet so if AI is starting to make stuff look procedural, then I think people will just veer away more often than not from the things that aren't working. Like if if a software is making all the artwork look the same eventually, because it's all got the same algorithm, the same uh, information that it was fed from the AI, then the industry just kind of starts to shift direction based off of what it actually just can see is good or bad with artwork or games or like all those things so maybe if you want to your point though it was is ai gets you to the procedural look yeah yeah. it saves you 20 hours of work of getting to that proceed to that stage and then now you can do your refining so fine ai doesn't look finished i don't think it ever will i think you always need an artistic touch but it's just got you to that point in an hour versus a week of work and now you can start going okay now let's break the procedural stuff and let's make this look like a piece of art. Yeah. That's where exactly. that's how I feel like that's how I perceive AI is it is gonna get me to a good starting point. My starting point is yeah. now a week ahead of my schedule. That's how I always perceived yeah. AI. I never th- I don't think we would ever okay, sorry. Not ever. You know, there's hundred years in the future, who knows? I don't <laughs> think we're ever gonna get to a point where AI gives us a finished product. At least that's my perception of it. And if it does, I'm happy to prove wrong. But like, I don't know. I always feel like there's going to be need, there's going to be need a human touch to it at some point. That's where I'm a little scared of AI to be, to be honest, that okay. like in, in the distant or I don't know how distant, maybe 10, 5, 10, 15 years that I do think AI will be able to create like, really realistic or stylized or all these types of things that we wanted to make where it doesn't it doesn't even need like that human touch anymore unless you know it's never going to be able to know or I, I can't even say never to be honest about this but it's never going to be able to know exactly the vision that you have in your head but it will be able to make things that many people or most all people i think would assume is like made by a person or made by Mm -hmm. a human and not ai like i think we could get to that point with it and it's really just about the amount of information it gets if you feed it like enough Mm -hmm. stuff 
then it's going to be able to pick up on all the subtleties eventually and the differences and understand it. Like that's that's that deep learning. <laughs> the that deep AI we were talking about earlier, the uh, the data we we're saying if you collect all that data, feed it enough information, and it knows what to do. Yep. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. We, I think a part. I mean, maybe I'm too dumb, but it's the comprehension side of it as well for me because it's. I was born in 1994. We had Lara Croft triangle boobs. We now have <laughs> some of the most. The, the soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> oh Jesus! Flash <laughs> memories. It's but, sorry. <laughs> in in twenty years, sorry. In what's that? Uh, twenty five years, we've come from that to Last of Us Two, and Death Stranding, and I'm like, that's mm. such a monumental leap in what is it comparatively short space of time. I'm like, okay, what happens in another twenty five years? What? And I know there's a point of diminishing returns, and I get that, but. I find it hard, you know, we, when we talk about this, we're like, oh, maybe in like 100 years or it's in the future. It's like, it's probably not that far away. Like, if we've seen how far we've come already, I'm, that's why I'm always kind of like, uh, I, maybe it's going to be sooner than I think just because like, even go back five years, go back 10 years, like the jumps up, they don't slow down. The jumps are still happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think what we're going to end up seeing, I guess, if we're going to talk about AI, and all of these sorts of things. I can see the job being now. Because we're starting to get to the point where quality, you know, like characters in like a, the, the key characters in the game are almost as good as we're going to want them to look, like apart from a few few fine details. Okay, we've mm-hmm. got like probably five, six years of development and maybe like other things start looking as good as them. Once we get to that point, it's like, okay, well, what's next? Like they can only look so good. Oh no, now we mm-hmm. can generate these on scale very quickly like that's where i think things will go is the speed of generation is what yeah. goes up not necessarily the quality would you agree yeah to that? absolutely yeah 100 percent. because i think there is you can't make something better than real life unless i don't know you're on drugs or something and then it's like <laughs> yeah man this is best than real life <laughs> World worst acid trip. <laughs> yeah exactly so i think there's only a there is a level of quality you can't go past uh without intervention so so ministers uh narcotics team <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh yeah so it's like you can't go past certain levels like you said at that point it's just kind of speed like how quickly then can you generate all these things and then already as i start to feel to a point like things are becoming more flooded and more saturated in so many ways too that yeah like it's it's great that everyone has the opportunity to express their vision and it's going to be quicker and quicker to be able to do that but then if everyone can do that and everyone can do it all the time and nobody wants to look at it anymore because then it's just all over the place. Are we seeing this for film? I'm I'm going to be doing this. As a, so in October, I'm doing a talk in Italy at a view conference or a panel about this conversation. It's to do with film though. You see like the Disney stuff and let's put like Disney, like Marvel movies and so like all the Avengers and all this sort of stuff. And the Lion King, Aladdin, these live action versions, these hyper realistic, which arguably did not do great at cinema. Then you have films like Spider Man into the Multiverse, um, and Claws, the Netflix Christmas movie. And these are like traditional but with like like AI improvements. But they, they mm. speak to us like in a far more traditional type of art. And I feel like the reason they did so well is the audience cinema audience has sort of become trained to realism to the point where they don't care they don't watch a marvel movie and go oh look how cool that cgi is they just accept it as an image they see iron man flying on a screen Mm. it's like yeah it's iron man like they don't really care it doesn't speak to them like artistically but then you watch into the multiverse and the artistic direction the style and Mm. like passion that went into it resonates with us As as an audience we can like we actually connect with it yeah maybe that's what's on the verge for games like games hasn't got there yet i don't think i don't think we we're at there for a long time yet but in our easily in our careers and our lifetimes we're going to see a point i reckon where it's like okay games are going to look as realistic as they're going to look 
what the audience needs to see something now we need to be inspired by something and i think games it's a lot easier to do that with because we're already having to create it's not like we're having to blend live action with real it's like no we already have to generate these things so adding that creative flair is maybe a little bit easier but that's something that's been on my mind recently like just seeing it happen in cinema i'm like games are about say what 40 years behind cinema so maybe in 40 years we're gonna see games go through the same life cycle of okay this looks as good as it's gonna look i'm kind of bored of seeing this now i want to see something different yeah. i want to see something more artistic i think we could go that way yeah yeah like it's in the, the same sense eventually it's gonna look so good you can't make it look any better so uh i can imagine there's gonna be a lot more stylized things coming out and people working on just stylized games because then the the stylized look isn't readily available for ai or photorealism that there's new things to explore with the stylized look there's new ways of art and new looks of art that you can create that no one's seen and so i guess that's the only way to make something better in quality than real life is to then actually take it past real life and start making it into something completely different. Um, like where else? Yeah, where else can you go besides that? I guess if you go to John Wick route, I think mean, John Wick did a great job where they kind of like threw these compositions and spaces and light rigs together, which were like these don't belong in real life. Like the way they lit the city streets in John Wick, the way they lit the clubs, the buildings. Yeah, like it's like I a play on real that? life. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, if if you if you give it enough information, you know, but it, it needs that info, so you have to be able to make it first, and then it can come up with it. I don't know though. I I don't know enough about actually how AI works. That if you give it enough info, how much can you tell it to start changing and making mm. its own idea of what it thinks uh, reality should look like, or what it thinks a stylized character should look like. I wouldn't be surprised if it could, though, because I'm just thinking of, like, um, Ben Wilson made a really cool node um, for, like, doing colour variation. And, it, like, it basically respects colour palette and the colour wheel and all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, mm. oh, okay. So that kind of, on a very basic sense, understands colour theory. Well, I guess if you can make that, then you can make an AI understand colour theory. And then in that sense, you can make nice colour palette lighting scenes that respect yeah. colour theory. Uh, yeah. There, we, we released a video like from nvidia is so cool that there's uh faces like like foot photography you know faces of people and then there's artistically drawn stylized faces on this side and what what you do is on the right side like you can uh pick between the different faces like man or woman or uh, different parts of the world or like so many different characteristics long hair short hair and then on the left side you're switching between the different styles of artwork and it generates an image at the bottom that blends the two together and you can create like these crazy characters of all different like races and genders and all this kind of stuff just by moving these two sliders around on either side it's so it's so cool because as it's making it it's like making this like wavy image as you're scrolling over the stuff and it's it's like morphing into all these faces and all this stuff and oh my goodness it's it's beautiful it really is beautiful um and, and it's like yeah yeah <laughs> terrifying. like uh have you seen gagan uh no i haven't so there we have this uh it's it's a almost like concept art yeah. sort of ai thing that has a ton of just information fed into it from photography and landscapes and oh, all over the place I have seen this. and you could, paint just a colors. flat color yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, that's super cool too like I you can make concept art like instantly oh really yeah my old job we used to have to um like create like landscapes and color palettes and all that sort of stuff and it's like it it was photo bashing for a long time there's someone showed me that and we we're like jokingly going i wonder if we could use this instead of photo bashing and then we tried it we're like oh okay this is way better than photo bashing so we we're still <laughs> using it for photo bashing but instead like yeah. i was searching online to find a perfect image we just made the perfect image and it started blending it all together and it was like it was um what's the word it was kind of like daunting that we went from it used to take us like when we we're concepts and backgrounds like 
two days, three days, and that was to do like one final. And it mm. went from that to literally half a day to generate three or four final versions. And we are just like, that's, that's a big jump. That's a really big jump. And that was pretty scary. Yeah. Um, but it's it's like amazing that like you know you can still get your vision out there but yeah. it's uh it's kind of then a little different because it's like your vision mixed with what ai believes your vision is <laughs> based off of what you, <laughs> what you told it uh but but what do you like like uh how, how do you feel about this um unreal unreal 5 demo was was pretty badass yeah, I've spoken about it quite a lot. I'm trying to keep my my expectations in line, only because mm. like, um, I mean, when you're doing personal projects, there's a bunch of features in Unreal that when you get to production you can't use. Um, mm. And I know this is probably going to be the case for Unreal Five. It's like, okay, here's a little bunch of crazy shit you could do. It's like, oh, this is amazing. And for personal projects, it's amazing. In production. I'll wait and see how much it can be used. And that's why I'm actually really glad mm. we have something like Fortnite. Because a lot of the cool stuff was coming to Unreal 4 was Fortnite was used as a test bed. And I'm like, okay, yeah. if that's the case, that it's going to be this like kind of test dummy for UE5 tech, I'm happy for it to be there. Like, I'm not a Fortnite player, and I know a lot of people hate Fortnite in the world. But I mean, it's paid for Epic Mega Grants, it's paid for UE5 probably. It's like done so much. And I'm like, okay. My expectations are basically Lumen is going to be good. I think that's just going to be amazing. Like, I think that's out of the box. I cannot wait to play with Lumen. Everything else, I'm like, I'm going to assume, I'm going to pretend it's not there until I see it in a production working. Because I assume yeah. most of it is not going to work in production. At least not immediately. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, that's something is, as a text being developed a lot of the times, it's probably... A lot of uh, you know alpha and beta status in the beginning, and most of it, I'm sure for that tech demo. Like I, I don't know. This is all just you know theory, mm -hmm. basically. I don't actually know for sure. But when they're making it all, of course, it was all organic. Uh, there's a lot of rocks. There's a lot of really organic shapes. Even like the armor, you know, lots of curves, and there there wasn't any hard surface uh, sci-fi looking things. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know how it would handle architectural buildings with you know like window sills and doorknobs and little uh, keyholes and all kinds of stuff like that how well the LED systems and um how well the optimization can can do the same sort of like yeah uh, yeah triangulation where it just compresses this all down to lower poly stuff yeah because it can't handle translucency i mean they announced it themselves like they purposely chose that scene because it was a very I don't want to call it a simply. It's a simple scene to light. It's a lot of opaque objects. There's no translucent mm. objects to shade. And they said they're still working yeah. out. But yeah, that's something. Not a ton of foliage. Shape. Oh yeah, yeah, that as well. I think the convex shapes is that. Yeah, you're right. Keyholes is a great example. Like how to handle that. Like that's a really complex shape. AI in software packages struggle to figure them out now. So it's like it. I'm trying to keep. I don't. I'm not like smack talking. I'm just like my expectations. I'm trying to keep very low. Yeah. Because I don't want to be like it comes out and I think I'm promised the world and I get nothing and I'm like oh, I'm disappointed. So I'm like Lumen will be good. Everything else, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, yeah. But one thing that was cool though was the uh, when I was researching the artists who worked on it. it obviously, there's a lot of Quixel people, but um, a lot of the texture artists. Were, I was like, they had no art station. I was like, oh, who who are these people? And they had IBDs. They were all film CG uh, artists. Huh. And I was like, oh, okay. This is interesting. So I was like watching their breakdowns and like there's a lot of Mari and Udims. And I was like, hmm. Film artist working on a PS5 tech demo. Curious. And we were speaking about this off air a little bit, but it's like these two worlds are coming together very, very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And that excites That's some. That is what I'm excited by, by Unreal 5. I'm hoping the line between a games artist and a films artist becomes so blurred where there's no longer really a difference. That's what I really want to see. We already have, like, mm -hmm. adaption periods. If you were to jump from NVIDIA to go work at um, Ubisoft and use Snowdrop, you've got to learn a new pipeline and a new workflow. So jumping between games and films in five years probably be about the same sort of adaption period. That's what excites me. Mm. Out of everything. That's what excites me the most. 
Yeah. Yeah. Like on the latest, like, I guess you saw, you know, we announced the 3090s and 3080, 3070, like, oh, new graphics cards and stuff. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's still a great card, man. It's all good. I want the memes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> don't feel bad. Don't worry. But um, in that in that sense, like the 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 card actually is powerful. That we we used it to uh, render like one of the first marble. Uh, marble mm-hmm. demos that we came out with when we showed off all the ray tracing tech and stuff like that. So don't feel bad about that. Like you know, they they can both <laughs> run marbles, maybe just uh, different versions of marbles. <laughs> well, is that your sales pitch? It can run marbles. Yeah. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> yeah. Marbles. We saw memes already. Like uh, 2008, can your PC run Crisis? And now it's like 2020, <laughs> can it run marbles? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's paper. Uh, it's true. <laughs> but but going off of that that was like probably the first time for me where i started to really feel that idea of working on games uh or films can start to become the same thing like if you if you've seen any of the artwork on like uh, my page or gavriel's page or uh you know gregor andre like all the awesome guys that that helped out uh you can you can really see like every single detail on this thing all the way up into like the finest grain that we tried to to push it to so you can have these crazy poly counts there's like over 100 100 million uh, polygons in a scene everything was like you know massive texture scales i think we have like 3 or 400 individually textured props in the scene so it's not like tiling textures. Like the whole thing is like uniquely textured, uniquely modeled, um, and it's all running in real time, which is just ridiculous. So like that was super exciting for me to finally be able to go with my like OCD tendencies to be like zooming in on all the little <laughs> details. <laughs> I'll change that. Like we we got to fix this one. Like update that, guys. Um, and. And you can't normally go into that level of detail in games because it just can't handle it. Like you can't run it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and although this was like an isolated room or an isolated project, I'm really excited with the tech that people are going to be able to make all kinds of crazy stuff with this. That yeah, that line is going to start blurring with what's a game artist, what's a film artist. I guess with that then. You're having to. So we spoke earlier about um, the AI stuff speeding up, speeding up. We're gonna speed up, speed up, speed up. Give it the monotonous tasks. I guess it comes mm-hmm. full circle because it's like, okay, you now have the ability to hand author and hand create all of these things in crazy detail. Obviously, that's time consuming to do that. Mm. Throw in there, okay. You've just say, say for example, you save thirty um, percent of your work time. AI, thirty percent of your workload has been solved by AI. Okay, that 30% can go back into making high detail stuff. Because like you said, if everything's hand authored, that's a time consuming thing. Like you're not using, you know, as many tiling textures or clever tricks. Okay, that's gonna take time. Oh, it's okay because we just saved a bunch of time with all the new AI tools coming to us, all the new procedural tools coming to us that allows us to do this. Is I you just saying that like that that whole like bit by the, the demo is like, oh actually, yeah click that's how it works now we're gonna get like more hand authored things just hand authoring takes less time now hopefully you know in the next two yeah two three four years ah. yeah <laughs> yeah it's kind of fun like maybe maybe um there's gonna be more tools that help us speed up the process but now we also have more power to yeah. show more in depth what we want to make so then more time gets added on because now we have to create more detail and things that people didn't see before. Like that's something actually, uh, when we were working on the first soul demo, like, which is these dancing kind of robot guys mm-hmm. way back when ray tracing was announced that we were always like, Oh, for optimiz- optimization, it'll be fine because like any of the polygons off screen are going to be rendered. So, you know, we can keep the poly count a little higher. And then we're like, wait a second. This is the first time we're working in ray tracing. All that stuff's going to be reflected yeah. on the character and bounced off. It's like, 
the whole scene's rendered constantly. Oh my gosh, what's he gonna do? <laughs> like the whole way we had to author the content was different because now you can't just hide with camera angles. If you have something reflective in the scene, they're gonna see it. Yeah, yeah. What's behind the camera? You're gonna know now. Oh shit! Yeah, I, I'm. You know what? That's my favorite. Um, I think he's. I don't know if it's Nvidia or Unreal who did it. They made a, a functional pinhole camera. Like they, there's, they're in a scene. And they actually made like it's in a parking garage, if I remember right. It's a pinhole camera, mm. and it actually, like when you do it, it, like the image is upside down, like how physics work. And I was like, I love that. I, I mean, I'm not a particularly techie person, but I did watch that. and I was like, I remember that class yeah. in science, sitting there learning about how light works and how cameras work. So then when I saw that demo, I was like, oh yeah, this is how, this is right. I remember this in, in in school. This is cool. I can't. I think it was yeah. unreal. I believe. Might have been. I think it was one of the evangelist uh, talks. Um, but to wrap up, I mean, dude, this is this is my yeah. longest podcast so far, which is impressive because oh. this has felt like we've only talked for like twenty minutes. <laughs> this is great. Um, what yeah. what is the? <laughs> we'll have album? to do another one. <laughs> oh no, we're doing another one. No, no, hundred percent. We've got to do another one. <laughs> uh, I mean, I need to visit America as well. Like next year, there's a lot of trips over to America, so we could do a live one. Um, oh, but, that'd be cool. Everything that you're working on, everything that you're involved in, and we've spoken about a lot about the future. For you as a person, and I wrap, I wrap every podcast up with this type of question. What is it you want to see in the next year? Where do you want to be? And I don't mean as in like, you know, lofty career ambitions or anything like that. I just mean as a person or as an artist. Is there anything you like? Is, is there a particular skill set or trait that you're looking at and you want to develop? Hmm. Wow, that's an interesting question. Cause, yeah, like, I never, yeah, nobody, nobody really asks that on a day to day unless you're going to go on into an interview or something. Where do you <laughs> see yourself in five years? <laughs> so I haven't had to prepare myself for that. Um, yeah, I'm afraid I've I think, a curveball a lot of people. It's fun. Yeah, yeah. I guess in my in my personal life a lot lately, I've come, especially with like you know COVID this year and everything we've all been thrown curveballs and really can see things can change in an instant and you don't really know what's going to happen. So I've started to, I guess, plan less and take a lot of things more uh, day by day. Okay. I still have some idea at least of what, what I'd like in the future, but um, for, for the career aspect, for the personal aspect, I guess I'm I'm just kind of along for the ride right now more so than I used to be and I'm I'm almost asking myself the same question as you is like oh yeah, I'm I'm excited to see what uh, where I'm at <laughs> what's going to happen <laughs> in the next year so that's probably not the answer you were looking for No uh, it's actually it's nice to hear that sometimes I think um with my mindset being so very I'm very um what's next, what's next, what's next. And I'm, when I speak to artists yeah. and it's always got this and I want to do this and I want to do this. It's it's nice to hear sometimes, you know what, I'm just going to enjoy and see what happens in the long for a ride. Like that's, it's refreshing to hear that some people can think like that and not everyone's as OCD as me and thinks my life needs to be mean, planned out. The, uh, yeah, that's the thing is like it was, my whole life was planned out, but just uh, so many things have happened in the last one or two years that, I I had to start changing my whole way of thinking, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll keep it short, but just in working for like a Silicon Valley tech company, the industry is always shifting and new tech is coming up all the time. And so you need to be really versatile and be able to shift directions quick. And so that's part of where the mindset comes from too, is maybe you'll be on one project one day and then the next day, you'll get funding for this thing and oh we gotta work on this now so let's give that a try um so i guess i've just kind of let a lot of things go and maybe maybe what i can say is uh in the next year i hope i can start traveling again that's, that's where i see myself i'd like that that'd be nice you need to come visit the uk the yeah great the great goes to the uk I got I got a few other friends out there too, so maybe we could get like a little round table podcast going or something. Now you're talking my language. I, I I'm down for that as long as there's alcohol involved. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although we need a review process and editing to go into that. Oh no, no, it's way more fun. No, 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 it's way more fun. We could play, we could play like uh, Ring of Fire whilst doing the podcast, and wherever we end up at the end, if we're still coherent by the end of the podcast, probably didn't drink enough. But I think that'll be that. That's an interesting idea. No review process, and hopefully, don't get cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> that sounds cool. I'm totally Dude, interested. I really appreciate taking the time to talk. This has been the like, like I said, this is the longest podcast, and it hasn't felt like it. And that's always nice to hear. Like, I love the fact that it feels like we've been talking for like 20 minutes. And it's like an hour 35. It's an, it's been oh, wow. an absolute pleasure, dude. Talking, um, everyone listening. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, dude, it's always my pleasure to speak to, to speak to people like you, man. It's uh, <laughs> everyone listening though. Like, remember to you know like follow share subscribe the more that the podcast gets shared the more that people get to hear the fantastic information the people like jacob have to share but everyone listening i'll catch you next week jacob been a pleasure man thanks so much take care